out here after 30 years, yeah, I ain't got nothing, but I'm gonna have something because I'm rich in personality, you know, and uh, I'm rich in love, my family love me, and that really, that's, that's really the, all that counts. What's up, what's up, shout out to everybody out there on Team Bank and Pam, man, much love, I appreciate the love, I appreciate the support. Uh, we back in here, man, we back in here, I know a lot of y'all been asking for this one and a couple of other ones. And I'm going to get to them as well. But today, man, I want to give y'all some updates on the one and only Notorious Poor Smith, Bo Billy. Yeah, Bo Billy, man. But before we get into that, man, I want to tell y'all, man, we got to get these numbers up. I appreciate all y'all who support me. I appreciate all y'all who watch my videos. But I need y'all to check your status and see if you subscribe. Because my analytics still saying that 70% of the people who watch my videos are not even subscribed. So, if we get some more subscriptions in there, man, and build these numbers up, man, we can spread this stuff far and wide. Move it around in the algorithm. I appreciate it when you leave comments. Good, bad, or indifferent. Just keep it respectful. And uh, like the video, man. Give it a thumbs up if you really like the video, man. So, I appreciate that. And that helps everything move around. It helps the channel grow. It helps us grow. Because we are family, TBP, stand up. So, y'all get on top of that, man. Right now, hit that like button, man. And let's get into this thing, man, about Bo Billy. As I, I, I told y'all in the first video about Bo, man, how notorious he was and how, you know, how much of a gangster he really was. Bo, Bo was that dude. Bo was a gangster gangster, you know, hot biggest Texas and um, trained to go at the drop of a dime, man, real talk. And I, I, I told y'all at the end of the, the, the first video that, you know, to the best of my knowledge, he was still alive. He was up in the mountains. He had been down a long time. And hopefully he was doing well, this, that, and the third. Well, yeah, since then, a lot has transpired, man. He, he, he got wind of the video. He got in touch with me. We, we've been corresponding back and forth. He calls me about once, twice a week. You know, he's still up there in the mountains going through it. You know, Bo is actually uh, 66 years old now, you know, and, and, and uh, he still got the heart of a, of a lion, you know, but he getting older. So, you know, his roar is a little, little lower, but he still got that, that, that lion heart, man. And he still fight for his liberation. He's still trying to get out of that penitentiary, man. Um, he uh, wrote me letters and stuff too, man. Said some of the uh, stuff he wanted to express. I told him I would do a recap on his video. He wrote me letters and stuff and expressed some of the things that he wanted to share with me and with y'all as well. So I'm gonna read, you know, some of his letters off as well. Got his letter right here. I'm gonna read some of his story off to y'all in his own words, Mo Billy in his own words. But man, uh, like I say, he he has a uh, he has, he, has, he has a big story, man. Like I say, he was a big part of the uh, penitentiary, man. When I came in there, like I say, his name was ringing uh, bells. And he did that for the entire times I, I was in there. You know, dudes like Sam Pitts, uh, Bo Billy, those were two of the most uh, notorious dudes in the system when I first came in, far as known for putting that work in. I'm talking about getting it in with their hands or however, however else they had to get it. You know, you heard their names repetitively over and over again, you know, even when I was in the jail, you know. So these dudes' names, like I say, they legendary in the Virginia penal system. And anybody who's been in the Virginia penal system can tell you that that's fact, not fiction. And, and, and like I say, Bo name is right up there, you know. He came in young and um, he started putting that work in and, and uh he earned the reputation. He actually earned his reputation. It was not given to him. It's not fictitious. It's real and it's earned. And uh, he put some work in, man. So I'm going to get into it, man. I'm going to read some of his stuff to let y'all know something about him. At the end of this video, too, as well, I'm going to leave his information for anybody who wants to contact him, want to write him, want to try to send him some assistance because he's still trying to get out of prison. He got some legal issues. Uh, he feel like he been done a misjustice in a lot of situations. So he looking for some type of assistance, some type of help, or any type of correspondence, man. When you behind them walls, that's what you need. That's your fuel that keeps you going, keeps you strong, keeps you pushing forward, man. 
You got to be able to see another day. You got to be able to foresee yourself uh, out, outside of penitentiary in order to keep your drive alive while you're in the penitentiary. So, um, yeah, man, I'm pray for Bo, and uh, I'm hoping the best for him. And I'm going to read a little bit of his letter that he wrote to me and let y'all get a better idea of who he is. All right. <clears throat> Say, uh, Bo name is uh, Henry Bo Billy Gorm Jr. Gorm. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. I ain't butchering his name up. It's G O R H A M. Gorm. I ain't never known nobody had that, that name right. But uh, yeah, uh, he's 66 years old. He said 66 years of age, born and raised in Portsmouth, Virginia. Uh, I've been incarcerated since the tender age of 18. 18 years old, man. Do the math to that, man. I just told y'all he's 66. He's been incarcerated since he was 18 years old. Amazing. 18 years old within the Virginia penal system. I was convicted in Portsmouth Circuit Court, given four years probation for shooting at a man who shot me. Right? He said, call, he called me the N-word in 1974. He said, uh, I'm still mind boggled about how I could be convicted of shooting at somebody who actually shot me. And this was a white man. He said, however, I was arrested a year later in Chesapeake, Virginia. Uh, cause two white brothers stated that a black man with a scar on his face robbed them in their store. Photos were shown to the police. Of photos were shown to the police. I was the only person in those photos who had a scar on his face. So obviously, I was picked up out of the photos. I wasn't even given a. I wasn't even in Chesapeake when this happened. Uh, I lived in Portsmouth, Virginia. And I was at home. However, an all-white jury gave me 25 years for having a scar on my face and being blamed for this incident that I had nothing to do with. Wow. Yeah, you know, that's that's deep right there within itself. He said, uh, I was convicted of another robbery that I did have knowledge of and I actually was present and participated in. I was found guilty of that and given 10 years. So... You talking about he went into penitentiary at the age of 18 with 35 years, right? But yet he's been in the penitentiary now for almost 50 years. Mind boggling, mind boggling. So he has, he said he entered the prison prison system uh, in 1975 at the age of 18. 1975. So Bo's been in prison since 1975. That alone is mind-boggling, man. 1975, to have a human being locked up or incarcerated that long alone is just crazy. But, you know, this is what they do in Virginia. Virginia had the longest um, serving prisoners in, in the United States at one time, and they definitely had the lowest percentage of a uh, parole rate, like 2% for over 30-some years. And evidently, Bo is a part of that. Um, Bo said, by no means am I projecting my image uh, to be a saint or something like that. He said, uh, because I wasn't. I wasn't by a long shot. He said, I did stupid things that teenagers did back in the 70s. But I did not rob the store in Chesapeake, Virginia. Nor did I deserve to get 25 years in Chesapeake, you know, <clears throat> back in the 70s. He said, me and my lawyer was the only two black people in the courtroom. No blacks was on the jury. Therefore, I was convicted. He said, I entered the Virginia prison system in 1975, where today I still remain in this system, almost 47 years later. I am in dire need of help to obtain my freedom. All right, he said, please listen to uh, some of my prison plight. Some of the uh, struggles and trials and tribulations that I done went through while I was in prison. He said, once I entered the Virginia State Penitentiary, 500 Spring Street, Richmond, Virginia. Now, that's where I told y'all that's where it was. That was, the, that was the most notorious prison in Virginia at the time. 
you know, I remember when I first came into prison, I remember hearing the legendary stories about, you know, the wall, that's what they call 500 Spring Street, the wall. You know, bodies was being buried in there, people was getting killed. So it's a legendary prison. So just imagine the mindset of a young man going in there with, with 35 years or something, and he 18 years old. 18, man, going up in, 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 in a killing field. Uh, matter of fact, that's exactly what he said. He said, uh, Richmond, Virginia, he said, it was just like entering a real jungle. Your life held no value amongst the guards nor the convicts. The guards were selling dope through the inmates, and the inmates was killing each other. He said, for no, the inmates was killing each other for no other reason. Just straight meanness was going on in there, straight violence. And this is some of the things that I explained to y'all how it was when I first came in, you know, in the 80s. So it, it just was a violent system, man. That's what it was. It was just out of control. People was not getting a whole lot of time for for what they was doing in prison as far as the violence. They wasn't getting a whole lot of time for it. So that elevated the violence. That, that elevated the, the, the um. The, the, the extent that a person would go to because the penalties weren't that great because they placed no real value on our life while we was in there. You could get way less time for killing someone when you was in prison than you could on the street. On the street, they was giving dudes life sentences and uh, hundreds and hundreds of years for a violent act. In prison, they was giving dudes back then when I come in, four years, two years, three years, ten years, you know? So that just put people in the state of mind that you know, when I'm when my back is up against the wall, then I'm gonna do whatever I got to do, and whatever happens, happens. You know, so uh, Bo said uh, in 1975, I became addicted to drugs. The guards were supplying drugs, and when I had no money, I began to rob the guards, and I began to rob the inmates as well. And at a young tender age of 18, I started to become one of the most hated persons in the system because of my drug habit. And I knew about that and I heard about that too, you know, that's, that's, that's basically how the legend of Bo Billy began, you know. He came in, he was a young dude, he was a big, he was a big dude, you know, just naturally big and strong. And he could fight and he had a big heart. So once he got addicted to the drugs, in prison, which you could get addicted to back then, because like you say, the guards was corrupt, the guards was bringing the drugs in, the guards was having inmates sell drugs, the guards was just as crooked, if not everybody that was in prison, you know, so once he became addicted and you can't pay for that, you can't su support that addiction, then he became, you know, a gangster, you know, he started taking it, and in order to do that in prison, you got to be willing to kill or be killed. Obviously, Bo had no problem with that, you know. So once he started doing that and showing that he had no problem with beating you down, putting a knife in you, doing whatever he had to do to make sure he got the drugs, then dudes had to learn to respect that. And along with that respect, it, it was more fueled by fear because they knew that he didn't care and they knew that he was going to do whatever it took to get what he wanted to get. So the guards knew that and the inmates eventually knew that. So this is how he started building his reputation. If you got it, I'm coming and get it. You know, I, I need it. So, uh, yeah, he said, uh, he said, I looked at it like this. The prison was a city within a city with no laws. The guards and inmates were criminals and doing lawless acts. Although I was a drug addict, I still wanted to live and get out of prison. So I tried to always stay prepared and focused. Because I witnessed inmates and guards committing brutal acts and things happening in prison behind their drugs and drug money. And I didn't want any of this to happen to me. Therefore, I became the most brutal and the most feared in the system because I didn't care. And I let it be known that I didn't care. And that's what I just told y'all. That was the reputation of him when I came in there. That, like I say, he was a go-hard dude. He won't plan. And if you wanted it, he was going to give it to you. You know what I'm saying? And if you had it and he was trying to get it, then he was going to take it. If he couldn't get it from you the way he wanted to get it from you, like by paying for it, then he was going to come take it from you straight like that. And if you ain't like it, then however the chips fall, that's how they fall. However y'all get it in, that's how y'all get it in. And, and um, 
like I say, when I came in, man, his name was just ringing so many bells. Even before I left uh, jail, I knew who Bo Billy was, or I knew the name of Bo Billy. And as I told y'all, I went to Southampton, and I left Southampton and went straight from Southampton straight to the wall. So the wall was actually my second stop in prison. So, you know, when I get there, his name is already, like I say, his, his legend is already legendary. So, yeah, man, he said, uh, <clears throat> he goes on to say, um, the inmates feared, the inmate feared me for robbing them. And the guards hated me for messing up their money from robbing the, the inmates. So, yeah, for robbing the inmates. So that stopped their drug flow, which also stopped their cash flow. So I became public enemy number one. Everybody hated me. And he, he, he telling you basically about what's true. You know, when you go against the inmates and you go against the flow or you go against the convicts and they hate you and then the guards hate you, you can rest assured that you, you, you know, you on the timer, man. You on the clock. You on the clock to self-destruct. Because if you hate it by both sides, then eventually things just ain't going to work out for you. And that's how it was for, for uh, COs as well. You have COs that come in there and they try to, you know, be so hard and be so strict. Or some of them try to go by so many rules because they so caught up in the system and they want to move up and they want to be a board or they want to be a major. They want to be something. So they cross their own kind as well as the inmates. And I used to always say that even back then. When you hate it by both sides of the, of the playing field, it's just a matter of time, man. You're going to crash and burn because somebody has got to, 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 to like you or to have be able to see something in you where they can deal with you on a certain type of basis because if no one can deal with you on any level, then it's just a matter of time. Yeah, you're going down. It's just a matter of time. And uh, this is what he says here too. He said, uh, he said, yeah, so every, everybody hated me. I was public enemy number one, but I feared none. So then both forces started plotting together to get me. The guards and administration fabricated bogus paperwork to get me out of circulation to get me off of the population. I was sent to a newly built Mecklenburg Supermax. That's what I was trying to tell y'all. Back then, Mecklenburg was a Supermax. Mecklenburg was Wallace Ridge, Red Onion, uh, Sussex, One and Two, came out. It was all of that roll into one. River North, because it was the only place that they housed the inmates that they considered the was the most notorious inmates in the system, the most violent inmates at the system. They also had death row housed there and, and those inmates. It was like a 350 population for the whole institution. And every cell was a single cell because every man was considered, you know, incorrigible or they, they just felt like they couldn't put him with nobody else because of the, the, uh, the level of, of violence that had already been displayed by each and every person that was on Mecklenburg. So... They say, both say they sent him there with, 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 you know, fake charges and stuff. They sent him to Mecklenburg, Supermax. He said, uh, it was brand new. He was one of the first people going there. Um, they say, he said, they sent him there for assault with my hands on another inmate. For fighting another inmate, which was just a straight fight. Um... And he said, this was because... Uh, an inmate attacked him over money that he so that he supposedly owed a guard for drugs. That was my first major charge, and I stayed at Mecklenburg for several years. I ended up getting transferred back to the penitentiary. The same guard that had inmates, the same guard that set me up had inmates still selling dope. So this time I started to trick them. I started to uh pretend like I would pay them for, for getting drugs from them. But all the time after I got drugs from them, I never paid any of them at all. Said uh I wasn't going I wasn't gonna pay because everything that was going on was illegal anyway. So why would I pay anybody? And then if any trouble would come behind me not paying, I was willing to do whatever it took and take out whoever needed to be taken out because I was feeding my drug habit. Man, he said then, he said, ended up, they was, the, the, the drug ring in there was so deep at the time and so much craziness was going on that 
The guards was making money hand over fist. I can remember when I first got into the wall, I used to hear all the rumors about it too, but the, 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 the male guards was coming in there supplying drugs and bringing drugs to dudes, having dudes sell drugs for them, actually literally working for them and getting big money out of it. The women was coming in there in two and they said the women was in there actually selling their bodies, selling sex because dudes was walking around in the penitentiary with cash money. Cash money, big money. You know, I mean, this stories of dudes that I know of and I have actually seen some had actually literally shoe boxes full of money in the penitentiary. Shoe boxes full of real cash in the penitentiary, you know, but I can remember this too and this what came about about that. It says that uh, Somebody some some uh, former inmate. I mean it's uh, God came in there names names not to be said came in there and actually had a money plate The God bought the money plate into the print shop. They had a print shop on in the wall where they actually printed up stuff. So he said the guard had snuck a money plate in there and they actually had a print shop and they was actually printing up hundreds and hundreds of dollars, man. Bills, 20s, you know, hundreds, 50s, you know, uh, uh, female inmates was getting caught up in this because all of the money and stuff was in there. So dudes was actually in this joint, man. Uh, <laughs> dudes was actually in this joint Tricking with the female guards in there with fake counterfeit money. Yeah, with counterfeit money, man. They was tricking with, with female officers with counterfeit money. Well, I consider what they say. I guess it's counterfeit because I used to hear it was counterfeit, but as Bo is explaining in here, they say they had a, a, a money plate. So I don't know if that money plate was actual from whatever you call the U.S. Treasury or whatever. But I do remember they say they had a lot of money floating around in the penitentiary and it came from you know once upon a time somebody had bought a money plate in there and they was just printing off money in the shop eventually it all came to an end because the the, 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 the feds got involved and the feds came in there and they shut the whole print shop down in the wall shut the whole print shop down people got indicted you know you probably can look this up or pull this up you know on the internet or i don't even know if they even got stuff like that on the internet prior to, you know, certain times and stuff, because I was just looking at something the other day about the internet, and they was, and I was asking them about that, and they said they didn't have it, this was pre the internet, but I always thought that you could go back and, and re-put this stuff on the internet, but, you know, what do I know about the internet, but anyway, I do remember these stories, and I remember, you know, like I say, the atmosphere of the wall when I went in there, how all the things that was going on, and how how it affected you know the climate of the penitentiary like i say when, even when i got there in the 80s it was already known and natural that this just was a killing field that when you walked out of that cell it was so ominous and dangerous in there when you walked out it was just like you could feel it you could feel it in the air you could feel the tension you could feel the you could look at the faces you could see it on people's faces the anger the frustration you know the 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 the, the suppression the depression you know the aggression all of that could be seen and smelt you know and felt in the wall you know i felt that the whole time i was there i always felt that ever 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 presence of, of danger you know and you never let your guards down in there so i'm reading as i'm reading and stuff the boy has sent me in the conversations that we done had and i'm putting myself back in his frame of mind back being in there young you know, or, 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 or early, uh, or late teens, early 20s, you know, and now you done caught a drug habit and you're facing all this time, then you got time for a crime that you feel like that you should, that you didn't do, that you shouldn't have had. So, and then you caught up in the drug game, you caught up in the extortion game, you caught up in the, the, the violence of the penitentiary, and now this your lifestyle. This your lifestyle now. This is how you live it. So, you, you got to think now, the frame of mind of a person that's in their early 20s and late teens, now you done already adopted the frame of mind whereas to you, you, you willing to kill or die. Life, you done devalued your own life because now what the people done did to you, they done made you change your whole mentality and your whole philosophy because of the conditions that you living in. So now he willing to, to live or die at, at that young tender age. It doesn't even matter to him. And for... 
people that's in the real world, this is supposed to be the time of your life when you're supposed to trying to be decide what path and what course you're going to take for the rest of your life, how you're going to live your life. But when you in these situations like in the penitentiary and it's going on like this, man, then, you know, you have a whole different perspective. You have a whole different way of looking at life. And that's why I say, man, prison will change you. It will change you in many, many ways. It, you just have to be mind strong and you have to, uh, you have to have the fortitude, man, and the endurance to last the things that you're going to have to go through. Because trust and believe me, you're going to go through some stuff when you're in there that, that uh, most humans, you know, ain't going to ever, ever have to experience, you know, because of the environment, you know. And I know there's a lot of things that go on out here in society that's horrible, that's terrible. But and when you're in that caged in environment, man, and you and you feel like you ain't got no way out, and there's so much uh, 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 violentness and, and, and craziness around you, man, it's just, it's just, it just takes that much to lose your mind. It takes that much to flip. It takes that much to just snap. But you have to maintain because you gotta wake up the next day and go through the same thing, if not worse. So I'm just trying to put myself in the frame of mind of him at the time that what he was going through because I knew what I was going through and I came in, you know, almost a decade after him, you know. So it was crazy, man. So like I say, man, that's what he was doing. He, 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 he was robbing in there to feed his drug habit, you know. Then they had the, the police that was corrupt in there. They done bought in a, a money plate. So they printing out money, bringing in drugs. You got female officers selling sex. And then you got Bo, he running around, he robbing everybody and willing to fight, stab, kill, do whatever he got to do to get what he got to get. So now he public enemy number one. So you already know when you public enemy number one, like I said, the forces is plotting against you. They plotting to get rid of you because you a threat to the, the orderly operations. You a threat to uh, uh, the convict's life. You a threat to the, 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 the officer's money. You just a threat, period. So when you a threat, period, they coming to get you, you know? And that's what he says, man. He said, soon after that, he said, a sergeant and a couple of officers paid. A sergeant and a couple of officers paid a 70-year-old prisoner that felt like he had nothing to lose. They paid him to go at Bo, and man, you would not believe what they did to Bo. Thank you, special. Yeah, pure delicious. Pure delicious, man. My name is uh, Banky, man. Everybody calls me Banky. That's the name that I got from my grandmother when I was young. I'm coming out here after 30 years. Yeah, I ain't got nothing, but I'm going to have something because I'm rich in personality. You know, and uh, I'm rich in love. My family loves me. And that really, that's, that's really the, all that counts.